Good afternoon again, everyone. For those of you who have joined us over the past few weeks, welcome back. If you're new to all of this, then welcome. Bonjour et bienvenue. Si vous avez nous joindre pour nos autres webinars, merci. Et si c'est votre première fois, uh, très bien. On espère que vous uh, trouvez la valeur aujourd'hui. I'm uh, Mark Healy. I'm the executive director of the Ivy Academy. That's the learning and development wing of Ivy Business School here in London, Ontario. Je suis le chef d'éducation éducative à l'école de commerce à l'Université de Western en Ontario. Uh, we've been impacted like others recently. We're rebooting our own business here. Uh, we're excited to be launching some new virtual programs. We talked a little bit over this, you know, about this over the past few weeks. They're purpose built for the COVID era. Uh, those programs are now live along with all of our tried and tested and true stuff that we've converted to virtual and to blended. Uh, we would invite you to check out our website if you're interested in more uh, details. I spent the last couple of days uh, with a power transformer uh, that's a manufacturing Guelph. They're in remarkably good shape, all things considered. It, but, you know, innovation for them is an open question. And I would say the last you know few months has caused them to think a bit more about innovation than they than they typically would. For now, it's the responsibility of R&D, and it reports into both marketing and operations. You, you can imagine I have lots of questions uh, about that, and they're thinking about what that structure is going to going to look like in the future. And that's frankly what we're going to talk a lot about today. We're fortunate to be joined by Ivy's own Rob Austin. Rob is uh, Rob is kind of a big deal around here, as they as they say in the movies. Robert D. Austin is a professor of information system at Ivy Business School, an affiliate faculty member at Harvard Medical School, and also Aarhus School of Business and Social Sciences. Before his appointment at Ivy, he was a professor of innovation and digital transformation at Copenhagen. And before that, a professor of tech and operations management at Harvard. Professor Austin is uh, widely published in both academic and professional venues, such as Harvard Business Review, Information Systems Research, and so on and so forth. Um, he's the author of nine books and more than 50 published cases and notes, three Harvard online products, a couple of MOOCs that are running on the Coursera platform, and uh, he has a simulation called Cyber Attack, which won the 2020 International Serious Gold Play Medal. His research on neurodiversity employment programs is funded by, by Shirk. So uh, before we get going, Sean, I know there's a fair amount of, of tech today, polls and slides and whatnot. Can you uh, talk a bit about what's going to go on today? Sure, absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Bonjour et bienvenue à tous. We're back with a new and more interactive streaming platform. I'm certain that you've all felt some Zoom fatigue like me, and this will hopefully be a pleasant break. Nous avons choisi une nouvelle plateforme de streaming vidéo. Je suis certain que vous avez ressenti de la fatigue Zoom, uh, mais nous espérons que cet épisode sera beaucoup plus interactif. If you're participating live, you'll see two panels next to the stream. Use the Q&A tab to send your own questions for Rob. Uh, also upvote other questions and reply with ideas. Our helpful chat moderators, Cal and Zoe, will be watching for questions with the most upvotes. We also have a polling tab where we'll sometimes ask questions back at you. We already have a quick two question poll active, so feel free to give your answers now. We're gonna show the results in just a few minutes. Veuillez regarder les deux panneaux à côté de la vidéo. Utilisez le panneau Q&A pour poser des questions. Vous pouvez voter pour les autres questions et répondre avec des idées. Lorsqu'un sondage est actif, soumettez votre réponse dans le deuxième panneau. If you experience any lag in the stream, uh, click the gear icon in the bottom right to adjust your video quality settings. If there is an interruption in the broadcast, just stay on the page and refresh after about 60 seconds. A quick note to viewers tuning in on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. You can also register to participate in future broadcasts at ivyacademy.com slash events. You'll be able to watch all of our uh, previous session recordings by clicking the blog link in the top bar. We have a great episode planned next week with Ivy professor and sustainability expert Tima Bonsal. You won't want to miss that. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Merci. Let's get into it. Okay, thanks a lot, Sean. Uh, that, that's Sean Ackland Grant, our, our executive producer, who clearly knows what he's doing. Thank uh, goodness one of us does. Okay, Rob, uh, let, let's get going. You hear about innovation. I hear about innovation a lot. It's it, it's become an overused buzzword in a way. So I, I'd like some framing from you. Tell me a bit about innovation in your mind, uh, a, a definition that you like to use and how you like to think about it. Sure, and thanks for having me, uh, Mark. Uh, so the there are multiple 
uh, there's a lot of innovation definitions out there. The one I like uh, is uh, innovation really has two components. Uh, it, it has to be something that is new or original or novel. That's component one. And it also needs to be um, uh, valuable. So uh, new and valuable. Uh, anything that's new and valuable, I think we can count as some kind of an innovation. Uh, the, some of the other definitions that are out there uh, say uh, some people will claim that an, 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 an something that's a good idea doesn't become an innovation until it actually reaches the market in a commercial form. I'm not a fan of that definition because I am interested in the process that leads to commercializable results. And the problem with that definition is there's a lot of reasons why something might fail commercially uh, that don't, don't have very much to do with the process. So when I talk about innovations, I'm mostly talking about uh, an outcome that is both original and valuable, if that helps. I think that, help, that helps a lot. I think about you know these last two days that I spent, I, I was doing strap planning with this transformer company. You know, but here's the situation they're in. They're they're in an old school industry with a, a bit of an old school solution, although they of course uh, you know t tweak and, and run continuous improvement projects all all the time. You know, financially relatively stable in, in spite of COVID. You know, they're affected to the tune of maybe you know eight or ten points, although have, just had a really good quarter. Uh, and they're thinking about what to do with cash flow, right? Do they keep their powder mm -hmm. dry or not? They're Clients are pushing them uh, to think about some new markets and think about some new products, which would take them into technologies that they're not good at. They they haven't developed capability mm -hmm. there, you know, kind of over a, a fifty or eight or eighty year period. And yet, uh, you know, at the at the same time, there's an opportunity, and they see it because some of their competitors are relatively worse off. And so, if you think about them, or if you think about this moment in time for lots of organizations, is is this really the best moment to push innovation in, in either products or business models? Yeah, well, the situation you describe is kind of classic, right? I mean, it's it's one that um, I think uh, a lot of people would say is the subject of, you know, Clay Christensen, he who recently actually passed away uh, earlier this year, he describes situations where you have companies that are, uh, committed to existing product markets and trying to figure out when the right timing is to invest in emerging technologies. And of course, he's the guy who's famous for the word disruption. And, uh, you know, the thing that he pointed out is a pattern that happens repeatedly where new entrants come in and uh, take away a part of the market that the established companies don't care about very much. It's a, it's a part of the market you know, customer segments where they're not doing very profitable business. And so, you know, ironically, when those customers go away, your financials may actually improve for a while. But then these other emerging technologies get better and better and eventually threaten the the mainstream. And the reason is such a compelling pro, par, uh, pattern is that it's happened over and over and over again in multiple industries. Mm -hmm. And even though he wrote the book in the 90s, people still fall for it. So if I were the company you're describing, that's the general issue I'd be worried about, right, is how do we maintain the current business? It's, it's walking a line. You have to maintain the current business and keep it healthy and satisfy the expectations of investors and observers and so forth. But you also have to find a way to invest sufficiently in what might become a disrupting technology. Now, that's in ordinary times. Uh, what's different now with the pandemic, I think, is that, and this is, I think, the general effect of something like a pandemic is that it jolts us, right? It, it takes us to places we would not have necessarily gone otherwise. And I mean that both in a physical sense and also in the sense of our thinking and, um, you know, how, how our points of view and perspectives are. And so the particular opportunity, I think, arise, that arises now is that we have now been forced into some things that we probably wouldn't have gone into intentionally. And there may be opportunity in that. So I don't know if now is the right time to 
to sink big money into emerging uh, approaches. Maybe, maybe it is because people expect the short-term results to be downwardly impacted anyway, and that might give you some headroom to do some of that kind of investment. But the real point, I think, is to be opportunistic, to look for ways in the current new situation from your new perspective uh, that you might uh, see opportunity that wasn't there in normal times. I know you like to tell the the story about cornflakes and the and the story about penicillin. Are they are they germane here? Do they do they matter in this context? Yeah, and I think what you're talking about is um, you know I uh, actually have a I have a research paper from 2012 in a kind of an academic journal called Organization uh, Organization Science. And it's uh, the the title of the paper is Accidental Innovation, and the subtitle is um, I, I don't remember the exact subtitle, but it's about uh, you know preserving valuable unpredictability uh, in in business processes, and uh, you know it's kind of the point I was making before that uh, there's a weird fact in the history of innovation that that innovations, uh, especially very important innovations, are highly correlated with accidents. Uh, there's a study mm -hmm. from the EU where they went back and they looked at major innovations and found that almost half of them contain some sort of an accidental element. And so, you know, that's kind of weird to start with. But when you start to think about it in terms of what I said before, that the, the thing that accidents do that is in common with our current pandemic era era is that they jolt us right they uh, if we were going to do innovation in a normal way if we were going to try to produce uh, originality or something new there are certain things we might think of to try but there's also a whole universe of things that we might not think of because our thinking and our imaginations are limited the great advantage in accidents and jolts and things like that things that were unanticipated but take us to a new place is that they take us to places, uh, you know, uh, thinking and uh, places in our imagination that we would not have thought of to go intentionally, right? So, uh, so the thing is, you know, you look around and say, okay, here I am in a new place. I never would have thought to have tried this, but now that I'm here, what is there that's valuable? So, um, and there's a lot of examples in history uh, that are, you know, really fun. Um, so um, the ones that you mentioned, uh, penicillin. Uh, penicillin, probably one of the greatest inventions of human history. You know, before penicillin was invented, uh, a family uh, that had five children might see only two or three of them reach adulthood because bacterial infections were so lethal. But the, um, you know, penicillin was actually discovered and Alexander Fleming, the inventor, was famous for expressing it this way. Um, he said, I was really just uh, washing my dishes. He said, I, my laboratory had gotten kind of dirty. And it's kind of like, uh, I always think about it with our students who, I know when I was a student, I accumulated too many dirty dishes in the sink and, you know, things start to grow on them, right? Uh, and that's what happened with his. He uh, he had some mold growing on some dirty dishes. And he when he, as he moved them to the sink to clean them, uh, one of the pieces of mold, and he didn't even notice at the time, uh, one of them fell off into a Petri dish where he was growing some bacteria. And a few days later, he noticed something was very, you know, uh, very aggressively killing the bacteria that he'd been growing. In the uh, he noticed this, and a very important step, too, in his thinking process is he didn't just notice it and say, damn it, my experiment is ruined, and start it over. He thought... Well, that's weird, right? What, 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 what's causing that, and why is that happening? And when, as his thinking process followed that that track, uh, he realized he was onto something that was really quite important. And you know, that was kind of the moment that antibiotic, antibiotics were invented. But the important point here is he never would have done that, right? That's not an experiment he intended. So, uh, so that's um, you know that's an example. Uh, there's a lot of examples, though. It's just surprising how many innovations are. Um, uh, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a whole list of them that you can come up with that are um, 
that are due to that accident played some part. Uh, there's penicillin, there's a smallpox vaccine, there's cornflakes. Uh, you mentioned cornflakes. Cornflakes is the result of somebody forgetting to turn on a machine that was to make uh, a corn-based porridge for at a health spa that the Kellogg brothers were running in Michigan. And uh, when he discovered he had forgotten, the worker had forgotten to turn it on the night before, he tried turning it on the morning after, and this strange sort of a cornflake came out, and, you know, the rest is history. So, um, I mean, another one that's kind of fun is uh, is Viagra, right? So uh, it was originally supposed to be a heart medication, and it had, you know, shall we say, an interesting side effect that they were smart enough to notice and realize that there was value in so all of these things jolt us that we wouldn't have tried to go uh, by ourselves intentionally. I mean, it strikes me that your your mind has to be open enough to observe and take in what's going on as opposed to being so focused on the problem you're trying to solve where you would kind of almost push that out of a way as an outlier or a problem or issue. Yeah, no, that's a huge and a, a very insightful observation. Uh, there's a, a two-stage model that uh, sometimes researchers use when they think about innovation. It's originally due to a guy named Don Campbell in the 1960s. And he described uh, innovation as a process of first creating something original. And he related it to Darwinian evolution. He said, first, you have to have variation. <coughs> But then the second stage, and this is the one that you were just talking about that's often overlooked, is you can create a whole lot of original stuff, but you may not realize what you've got, right? There's a second stage where you have to look at what you've created and sort apart the things that look valuable, which are likely to be a relatively small subset, from the things that are you know, not valuable and not worth pursuing. Uh, and so... You know, what you point out is, you know, as Fleming didn't just um, go, uh, damn it, uh, and restart his experiment. He connected the dots. Um, uh, the the Kellogg brothers looked at the cornflake and said, that actually looks interesting and let's try eating it. And it's pretty good. Uh, the guys who created Viagra didn't say, well, you know, that's not a good heart medication. Let's just toss it they noticed the side effect and decided to follow up on that. So that second mm. stage is really important. And honestly, humans and organizations can uh, tend to be pretty lousy at both. Uh, they're pretty lousy at coming up with original ideas because we tend to get set in our ways and produce things. The new things tend to be a lot like the old things we've produced. And in the yeah. second stage, the things we see value in tend to be a, a lot like the things we've seen value in in the past, right? So we have a real problem recognizing unfamiliar forms of value. I, I think that's a good bridge to where we want to go next. I know you you talk a lot, you teach on this idea that innovation is kind of hard. Innovation tends to be difficult, as, especially at an organizational level. And, you know, if you think about, you know, leaders, uh, especially right now, how, how can leaders be encouraging innovation? How can they be getting teams to be thinking about an innovative kind of productive mindset with, with some of the kind of barriers and challenges that you, you see a lot of? Yeah, I think it is just to follow up from what I was talking about before. One thing that I think is useful and that I often recommend to managers is that they think of both of those two stages uh, separately. So, uh, you know, question number one is what can you do as a manager to help your employees and to help yourself even create new and more original ideas, right? And, and some of that has to do with, you know, uh, there may be brainstorming techniques. There may be ways of unanchoring from your past business uh, at Boeing uh, they use an idea that they call an approach they call the seven ways. And what they mean is they don't when somebody's trying to solve a problem, they don't let you get away with just one or two ideas. They insist on seven. And the first couple or three or four may be pretty easy to come up with. But to really get out to seven, 
you have to really unanchor yourself from what your conventional thinking is. So, you know, there's techniques like that. Uh, another thing that people have often observed is that um, diversity of perspective. So if you can put a team together that's diverse, they're more likely to come up with diverse and different ideas. Stage two is different. Uh, but also similar in some ways. Diversity helps in the second stage as well when you're trying to recognize unfamiliar value because people from different backgrounds and different disciplines uh, can see things in different ways. And if you've got a, a range of people on your team, somebody's going to spot the value, right? Fair, fair enough. Sh Sean, I, I, have you got a poll ready for, for us to launch out to the audience? Yeah, so we've actually had one poll uh, active for a little while now, which was how open was your team to innovation before COVID and after COVID? So we've got some some interesting results that I will uh, put up for us right now. Um, the, uh, the average score is 6.8 out of 10 in terms of openness to innovation before COVID. And then afterwards, we see uh, 7.8 with a, a much clearer spike around 8 and 9, uh, even some uh, quite a few more 10s. So um, it, it's interesting that people are more open to innovation. But at the same time, Rob, I'm hearing you describe quite a, a number of pitfalls that that enthusiasm could get you into. Yeah, I kind of, I mean, this is, you're right. These are very interesting results. And I do, I mean, I think part of what you may be seeing there is it is true that now that people have been jolted, they're seeing new opportunities, right? I mean, it's not unlike when something accidental happens and you find yourself in an entirely new place uh, or, you know, seeing something you didn't think of to try to produce that you may see new opportunities. So uh, even though, you know, and there are, there are ways, we haven't really gotten to, I think, what makes innovation so hard in normal times. Uh, but this... Uh, I think this does reflect that there is opportunity in a jolt, right? Is that uh, that that to me looks like a, a meaningful difference? It's a it's a full point jump with with a pretty high spike around eight or nine, and I think I'm with you that the jolt probably has opened people's minds. It it may be necessary for some folks responding because they they just there is no other choice at this point. I, you're, you know, you're fairly in touch with industry yeah. and you're, you're fairly in touch with your colleagues. Are, are you seeing a necessity for in innovation as much as an opportunity right now? Yeah, I'm sure that's part of it is that there's literally some things we can't do in the old ways. And so we've had to figure things out very quickly. Um, now, you mentioned this at the outset, Mark, uh, certainly in our business, uh, when it comes to delivering professional development or when it comes to delivering classroom experiences, uh, we haven't been able to do those in the traditional way. So, you know, I mean, at, at Ivy, we shut down, I think, on a Friday and restarted on a Wednesday and everything was online. Right. And so, yeah, I guess you'd call that innovation, forced innovation. Right. Forced innovation. Yeah. I know. um a way that you that you think about why innovation is hard is around the idea that companies are so rigidly measured, particularly around financials these days. You know, in, and that's not necessarily an, an, an unhealthy thing. You know, over over twenty five years of kind of getting good at it, this obsession with revenue, and in some cases, if you're public quarterly income targets uh, is you know has has become a, almost a religion. But how do you think about that in the context of innovation? Yeah, I think there's a, an easy solution people come up with. Uh, I say I say easy. I mean, kind of too easy. That uh, sometimes people will, uh, you know, kind of pronounce the platitude that we could innovate if we could only get free of these constraints, uh, you know, that have to do with delivering quarterly results and so forth. And you know, while I think there's something to that, and we do see things in innovative companies like, uh, you know, Google famously puts aside 20% of some employees work activities where they're not allowed to work on, you know, their main jobs. They have to follow pet projects and, and 3M used to do that before Google did even. So there is, it is true that in order to innovate, you have to create some kind of slack in the process. 
that you have to either decide you're going to invest a certain amount of funding, not just towards moving towards your deadlines, but towards learning or towards experimenting mm -hmm. or something like that. So that part's true. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reason I say it's too easy is because, and you just said this too, Mark, the need to satisfy investors, the need to meet your business targets and so forth, those are completely legitimate. And even more than that, uh, it, you have to realize one of the reasons that innovation is hard is because many of the things that you would do to produce original outcomes, valuable outcomes, right? And so, you know, remember, there's two parts to the definition of innovation. It's it has to be original and it has to be valuable. And the truth is yeah. often in innovation processes or, you know, if you get a, even if you're going to have an accident, most accidents are not helpful, right? So even though when we look at the set of great innovations and we see accident happening in correlation with them, there's many, many more accidents that are not helpful, right? And a manager can't run around his organization just strewing accidents about, right? Uh, you have to, um, you have to innovate, but you also have to not burn the place down right you also have to not uh yeah. you know not miss your 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 quarterly targets so um there's a there's an exercise that i like to propose when i talk about this i don't know if this is the time to go into it but i i um i can unfold that a little bit if if you think it's a good, yeah, time. A good time it is yeah yes yeah so what, i often do this with executives i say okay so you know we've decided that we have to allow room for variation. And, you know, usually we've been talking about accidental innovation at that point and that, you know, the fact that it is true that innovation is fueled by variation, whereas we have a whole bunch of systems in business we use to try to reduce variation in business processes. So, for example, at 3M, uh, uh, they, uh, this is uh, under uh, McNerney, when he was CEO there, he was from GE, and he brought Six Sigma with him. And as you know, GE is really big into Six Sigma. And McNerney mm -hmm. put Six Sigma in place throughout 3M, one of the most innovative companies in the world at that time. But when he put it in place in the, um, you know, in the product development organization, he drove down variation because that's what Six Sigma is all about. But he drove out good variation as well as bad variation. And they had trouble innovating after that. And they really haven't made it all the way back, I think, uh, since then. Uh, so the, you know, the exercise I like to, you know, we've been talking about that in, in um, I like to propose the following exercise. So I say, everybody, we could try it here now if you like. Everybody who's out there listening, uh, you know, grab your cell phone, say, and pick up your cell phone. And I'm going to tell you what we're going to do before we do it. So uh, I'm going to count to three. So I'm going to say one, two, three. And when I get to three, I want you to throw your cell phone as hard as possible against a wall or a floor. And we'll see if we invent anything. Right. And, um, and so, of course, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that no one out there has actually done that. And, uh, you know, I've never had anyone actually follow through on this exercise in class. And the point is, you know, we're going to have to throw a lot of cell phones at the wall before we see anything valuable. And this is why innovation is so hard is, you know, we need variation, but most variation is not valuable. And so somehow we've got to have a strategy for experimenting adequately doing things that are costly and potentially even damaging. And we're in search of those rare instances of, of you know, outcomes that are both valuable and, um, and original. And uh, given the reality that most original outcomes are not valuable. So there's a lot of possible solutions to that. Um, you know, people talk about creating sandboxes, places where mm -hmm. we can afford to fail. Uh, there are also uh, increasingly there are technological options. Uh, if you can explore or experiment in simulation, then typically it's a lot cheaper to fail in simulation than it is in sure. real life. 
Uh, I worked for Ford Motor Company for many years. And, um, you know, we used to crash test automobiles. And I think it cost about $200,000 every time we did a crash test. Um, obviously, it's a lot cheaper in simulation. So, um, so we were able to test a lot more things and innovate a lot more when we could explore more cheaply and rapidly. If you think about, you know, the standard operating mode that, you know, generally is going to put that your idea of value through a kind of revenue first lens, you know, what, what actions do you, do you recommend to a leader? And I'd like you to think about this, the CEO where it's hard and easy at the same time. And then to sort of a unit manager that doesn't get to control the, the entire organization. How, how do you shift your thinking, you know, sh short of breaking your phone? How, how do you kind of shift out of that revenue mode. Yeah, well, you know, it, it is hard. And um, I think uh, the people who have succeeded at it, and let's take the CEO level first, that they've managed to earn a certain amount of credibility. Um, I mean, it's a little bit trite at this point to bring up Steve Jobs, but, but nobody was going to give him a hard time about trying something exotic, right? right? <clears throat> because he had been so successful in uh, in doing exotic things are things that would have been viewed as exotic. So, you know, I think at the at the top, it starts by saying we are going to commit some of our funding to learning, to experimenting, to exploring. And you also have to have some skillfulness in saying that to the board and to the shareholders, um, you know, that we do have to invest in, in our future. And that may, in the short term, detract from the bottom line. Uh, I think if it happens at the senior levels, then it makes it a lot easier for the managers at the lower levels. Um, but, you know, I think, um, you know, pretty much everything, every tactic you'd be inclined to use is about, you know, you know the objective is, is there a way in my organization that I can make exploration uh, cheap and rapid? Right. And uh, if you can't afford if you can't do it cheaply, you can't afford to do it very much. Right. That's just the reality. So um, you know, I mentioned a couple of things before, like if you can use technology, do it in simulation. Uh, this is one of the reasons why 3D printing is super important, because, you know, you can try things on your computer and hit an enter key and go to the next room and actually experience or handle uh, a changed physical object. But I mean, the idea is to get these iterative cycles going in your in your business. Um, and I think more, you know, more generally to, you know, a lot of things that we have traditionally done in a very sequential planning based mode because we couldn't afford not to do it right the first time or almost the first time. If you can figure out a way to convert those into a more iterative mode, then you will typically um, you will typically improve the innovativeness. Uh, one of the things I've discovered from studying innovators in a lot of different contexts is that the shape of innovation is iterative, not sequential. Uh, the methodology is iterative, not like a waterfall, right? Yeah, I mean, it bridges you know back, back to kind of agile software development, which has, has become on, on almost a management mode. I, I know we wanted to take some audience questions, so I'll I'll tee up Sean in a minute, but in my, you know, in my consulting life, a question I get a lot is shouldn't, shouldn't we just performance manage and pay people? And there are pluses and minuses to that, but the, my view is there are more pluses than minuses. If, if you make it an objective, you know, even, even if it, even if it's not significant, a manager will generally pay attention to it. And if part of their incentive pay is tied to that, Right, and, and they are managed to it, or there are discussions about that that happen more than once a year, they'll pay attention to it too. Yeah, I think, uh, I think incentives and bonuses and, and things like that are part of the solution. But they're also, uh, they're, it's, it's complicated when it comes to innovation. There's a really great TED Talk by Dan Pink uh, called um, yeah. The Puzzle of Motivation. Uh, and one of the things he shows is that when we get too direct with our incentives, we actually cause people to narrow their imaginations, right? That they, they don't reach as widely for a solution to a thing. And it, it, can, um, it can 
shut down innovation. That said, I think we're if we're a little bit more creative with our incentives, you know, if if we set organizational objectives in terms of converting things into, and I'll use the word you used, more agile processes, for example, uh, if we set objectives like Google does, it says you must devote a certain amount of your time to exploration, not just, uh, you know, doing your daily job. Uh, then we can uh, we can make uh, progress with incentives. Uh, I think a lot of people, though, like some some really straightforward approaches to incentives and innovation. Uh, I'm not sure they do work. Um, so, for example, if we paid everybody at a product development organization five hundred dollars per patent, uh, honestly, I think that gets just a little silly. Uh, you know, either you know it either gets people in a mode of trying to come up with little patents. Or if they come up with a really big, important idea that's going to make billions of dollars, then paying them $500 for it looks kind of stupid, right? I mean, yeah, you're going to make $5 billion, but take this $500. So, um, so um, you know, I, actually, there's a story, if, if I can relate it very quickly. Uh, I was listening to the um, chief scientist at one of the major pharmaceuticals firms. And uh, he said something just in passing as he was talking about their R&D process. And he said, um, the thing he said in passing was, he said, I've finally gotten our merit pay, pay, our merit pay program to a, to a point where it doesn't interfere with our research and development processes. And he just went on. And, but in the Q&A period, I asked him a question. I said, that's an interesting statement. Is the fact that your merit pay process uh, doesn't get in the way of your R&D process, is that the best thing you can say about your merit, uh, merit pay process? And there was a long pause where he was clearly thinking about what he could say, right? And finally, he just simply said, yes, that's the best thing I can say about it, right? <laughs> and um, he... he, he, uh -huh. he so he ultimately, you know, he ultimately later when I was talking to him privately said the board was making him put in merit pay for his R&D workers, but they kind of thought it was, you know, they didn't like it because they said, look, I'm not in this for 500 bucks for a patent. I'm in this to cure cancer, right? Uh, or, sure. Uh, and so, um, I mean, this is another thing I think we have to realize is that when people innovate, they often have motives that go well beyond, you know, meeting the next quarterly results. And we have to honor mm. that. And we have to let people, um, I mean, we have to, we need managers in innovation processes. We can't just let people go play crazily, right? But we also have to realize that innovators don't need to become managers. That's our job. Their job is to you know, play as much as uh, they can and explore as much as they can until it becomes a problem that we have to step in on. I spent a bit of time at uh, the Perimeter Institute in, in Waterloo. Their whole model is built around the idea of taking things away from innovative people, T taking an administrative responsibility away and taking t teaching responsibility away and providing them with a safe haven to, to think and, and do their job. It's, that's interesting. Uh, Sean, I, I want to, yeah, I want to come yeah. back to you at, at this point to, you know, you've been watching the Q and a, or is there anything interesting that's coming in from the audience you wanted Rob to get to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one question from Tom in the, in the Q and a here is around the role of scarcity. So, I mean, we've, we've talked about the, the pandemic a little bit and about crises kind of placing restrictions on innovation. Um, what role does, does scarcity in terms of resources and ideas and communication play in the process of actually developing novel and valuable solutions? So if you're innovating with extreme limitations, does that make you sharper? Yeah, there is an interesting effect in the research that suggests that constraints actually uh, help us with innovation, right? So, so one strategy for innovation is to... Uh, you know, put in artificial constraints and, you know, say uh, you can do this, but you're not allowed to use certain tools or you can do this. Uh, you know, we want you to go accomplish this, uh, but you have to, uh, 
you know, do it with certain handicaps. And, you know, it's, it's a strategy. It's a technique, really. It's not unlike, you know, it's a technique in the same uh, category as uh, I'll, I'll, there's a whole bunch of uh, other sort of micro techniques. Um, but yes, I think there is a sense, you know, not only are we jolted to a different place, but we're also seeing scarcity and constraints that we haven't seen before that we have to work around. And there's no doubt that that can produce novel and potentially valuable outcomes. Sean, anything else you want to get to before we move into our last territory? I think a few of these questions will be answered by our uh, our last pastor. Let's move on. Okay, then let's let's talk about the pandemic. Let's talk about COVID, Rob. You've been paying attention. What, what do you think we we are collectively learning here? What have you seen in the last eight or twelve weeks? Uh, so. Yeah, I think, uh, and I, uh, you know, I could talk about an example uh, or two in a minute, but I think uh, what we're seeing is that when, you know, there's a lot of things that we have been forced into by the pandemic conditions and, you know, very unprecedented conditions, uh, things we certainly a year ago didn't even imagine. And some of the things that we've been forced into, we may be quite eager to pull back from. We may want to be really eager to get back into the way things were or whatever. But the other thing that's happening is some things that we're trying, and there are things that we wouldn't have tried because we didn't think of them, or there may be things that we did, haven't tried before, even though we've thought about them a bit, because there were reasons we couldn't, right? So so you know, maybe there were... Um, uh, you know, institutional uh, rules against it or or even regulations or laws against it. So if you think about and, you know, one of my favorite examples right now is healthcare. Uh, you know, there would have been a huge there would have been a huge outcry if we suddenly said in Canada, we're going to go completely to remote doctor's appointments to the extent we can. Right. Uh, but the, the pandemic forced us into that. And the thing that we discover, I think, and that's, you know, in that case, it works better than we might have thought it did, right? And and so, you know, I would urge every organization to kind of go through a process where they say, you know, what are the things we've been forced into? Which of them are in the category of things we don't want to continue once things kind of get more normal? But what are, more importantly even, what are the things that we have now discovered are actually, um, you know, even more doable than we thought. Uh, one that people bring up a lot is, you know, we're working remotely. Uh, so um, I've heard, you know, in the last 48 hours, I've heard from people in companies who have said, uh, we're probably not going all the way back to having as many people in the office as as we were, as we did before, because we've discovered, and, you know, we weren't going to do that before because we had reservations about, you know, people in their home, do they actually do work when they're at home? But what we are discovering is they're getting this, getting the job done. So why should we have extra real estate? So, yeah, that, that one I find, uh, I will not be critical. I, I find it interesting that organizations are getting to that conclusion so early, not, not having had a long time frame to measure impact on culture and team building and, they're not even through a year's worth of results. Are, are we really, are we really sure on the productivity and the results? Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of, uh, one of the things is that this really motivates, I think is a need to study these things more thoroughly, but, but it is true that we are doing experiments that we probably never would have done in different conditions. Right. Uh, if it weren't for a pandemic. For sure. One one innovation that I, I hope is here to stay is I'm I'm not I'm no longer asked for my ID at the grocery store when I buy a bottle of wine, uh, which as much as that was great for my ego before that is, that, is, that is a tremendous innovation that I hope is here to stay. I, I wanted to give you. I'm, an I'm, I'm, I'm jealous. I never get asked for my ID. I'm I'm jealous, Mark. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna pull that punch, Rob. I'm not even I'm not even gonna go there. Um, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about neurodiversity because uh, it's a it's an area that you spend some time in. 
Um, can you just can you talk a bit about your work there and what, and what you've done as it relates to, to innovation, education, work, workplaces, et cetera? Sure. And, uh, you know, it does have a connection because, you know, I mentioned before that diversity is one way that we produce more original outcomes. You know, that's that stage one and the way that we see value in new and unfamiliar forms, that's stage two. And as I mentioned, companies and people are pretty bad at that, especially stage two. Uh, business history is full of examples of things people invented but didn't realize were important. Um, so the, the neurodiversity thing comes in as a particular form of diversity. Uh, neurodiversity refers to the idea that, you know, there are people in the world and a, actually a quite a large number who are uh, cognitively uh, diverse. Uh, the most obvious uh, category is people with autism, uh, but there's also people with conditions like dyslexia, dyspraxia. Uh, and et cetera. And, you know, the basic idea, the philosophy here is that this is a difference, but let's not regard it as necessarily a disability. Uh, it is a way of uh, approaching things that might reveal new sources of value. So, you know, there's research that suggests that people with autism and dyslexia have superior pattern recognition capabilities, or not all of them, but some of them may. And so, um, you know, there's, a, there's been a whole movement that started back in 2004 when a small Danish company uh, uh, called Specialisterna, uh, it's, it means the specialists in Danish. Their founder, Torkel Sona, had a, his third child was diagnosed with autism. And uh, he started a company to employ people on the autism spectrum. And now uh, Microsoft, SAP, Hewlett Packard, uh, EY, uh, Ford, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, and many, many others all have programs like this. Um, mm. And they're discovering, you know, they're not just, it's not just about, it's partly about tapping talent in areas where they can't satisfy demand for that talent. So like business analytics, cybersecurity, uh, some jobs are going unfilled in those areas. And so it makes sense to tap new talent pools. But to get back to our topic today, they're discovering that this is also turning out to be a source of innovation because people are bringing new perspectives into the conversation. Um, you know, people who see things in different ways because they're, you know, you, you could say it metaphorically that they're actually wired differently uh, in their brains. And it, it turns out, you know, what we might have thought about as a disability is actually, a, you know, and sometimes people will call them superpowers, right? that there's uh, something to be offered. Um, hmm. You know, it's, it's a different ability, but it's an amazing ability in some instances. We're, um, it makes we're coming up on... Of... Yeah, I, you know, are there... You, you've talked about some pretty big organizations that, that have employed this. Are, are there examples of, of innovations or products that, are, that have sort of come out of those programs? Yeah, uh, I've written a number of cases about these um, these programs, and so uh, you know some of them are process innovations. Uh, EY tells a very interesting story where their first class of people in their program, which was four people in the Philadelphia office, uh, in their first week they noticed some problems with some of the training materials and the training processes that no one else had ever brought to anyone's attention. And, um, and then they proceeded to rewrite the materials. And in their first two weeks, they, um, you know, they created materials that uh, EY reckons, I think the number was about 25 million in savings. So, um, and, um, you know, who knows, I mean, uh, why no one had done that earlier, but, um, and, and there's just a lot of examples like that. Uh, the other thing that tends to happen is, um, we discover that when we make, uh, you know, we create structures to accommodate people who need accommodations. So, you, you know, maybe they're overly stimulated by audio auditory uh, stimulus or whatever that, you know, when we try to improve things for particular categories, often the benefits spill over into larger categories. So, you know, we design something for people with autism that are in the workforce, and then we discover everybody benefits from that. So, um, 
you know, at Hart Schaffner and Marx, which is a suit maker in northern Chicago, they, um, you know, they, they came up with signage and color coding and so forth that was needed by the people uh, who were in their neurodiversity employment program. But once it was in place, they noticed efficiency in, in uh, process improvements because it helped everybody. So interesting. So that's a that's a great example. We're um, as usual. We're coming up on time. We never never have enough time on on these uh, live streams. Sean, you've been watching the Q and A. What did, what did Rob and I not get to that you're seeing coming in from the audience? Yeah, the the top question right now is actually around culture. It's how do you build innovation into the mm. culture of a business? And the the second question is is similar. Um, we actually have been conducting a, a word cloud around this question: which organizational values help encourage innovation at all levels? Uh, and so maybe we can maybe we can get into that question with the last few minutes here. Um, looking at this word cloud in front of us, uh, trust, open mindedness, and freedom to fail are the three standouts. So what would you say, how does that translate to culture, Rob? Yeah, I think, uh, I think those are excellent uh, contributions by the folks out there. Um, I think the tough one there, uh, you know, they're all a little bit tough, but I think the really tough one is the freedom to fail. Um, and, um, you know, the freedom to fail, the reason we have trouble with freedom to fail, it's back to my cell phone exercise, right, is because it's expensive to fail. And um, and so uh, a lot of it has to do with, you know, somehow we have to, um, you know, there's two, two possible approaches. We can make it cheaper to fail, and I've talked about that one a good bit, but we can also make it clear, uh, uh, you know, in the culture of an organization that, we can create a culture where uh, failure is valued. I, um, it's not easy, though. I mean, I've uh, I have heard of organizations where, when they had failures, you know, they tried something, it failed. Uh, they would have a particular company that I have in mind. They would go out into the parking lot uh, outside the headquarters building and they would take all the documentation associated, or at least some of the documentation, they'd probably keep some copies and they would throw it in a big pile and they would, uh, ceremonially burn the documentation. Right. And then, uh, celebrate and have a little bit of a, you know, we just learned something party. Um, I don't know. That seems a little bit, uh, over the top to me, but I do think, um, you know, if we can figure out ways to, and there are cultures like this. I mean, at certain design firms manage to uh, keep innovation going uh, very much at the same in the same in the culture of the organization. IDEO is often cited. Uh, one of the things that comes from my own research is let's get over the idea that we have to resolve the tension between innovation, or, uh, you know, when they, whenever conflict appears between innovation or, you know, impulses to try something new and, you know, worries about the bottom line, let's get over the idea that we should resolve that tension in one favor of one direction or another. And let's just create a culture where we maintain that tension and know that we're going to have to have that conversation over and over again. Um, this paper that I'm talking about is we talk about it in terms of a, you know, the economic and the creative have a conversation uh, that um, uh, in, that is ongoing. That's not one that ever resolves itself completely. And that's a delicate balance. Um, Dick Nolan and I wrote a paper very many years ago called the, um, you know, that it was about balancing the influence of stewards and creators. And stewards are kind of like managers. We call them stewards because their primary motivation is to uh, is to watch carefully after the shareholders' money and not spend a dollar past the break-even point. Uh, and then we said, on the other hand, we have creators who don't even know where the break-even point is, but they, um, you know, they very much want to solve world hunger or or something like that, or, or cure cancer from my earlier example. And, uh, you know, we talked about bridging personalities, uh, people who understand both camps. Uh, Eric Schmidt, who was the chairman of Alphabet slash Google, uh, 
I had the pleasure of working for Eric uh, a few years ago, uh, pretty directly in a sort of a startup venture. And one of the things he was able to accomplish when he was the CEO of Novell is that he had credibility on the business side, you know, uh, but he also had credibility on the engineer side. And at the time, in, the Novell needed to realize that their proprietary networking standard called IPX was never going to win over the open standard IP, even though the engineers could show, you know, 20 ways that that IPX was better than IP. That is just that battle was over. And because Eric could probably write a compiler over the weekend if he wanted to, he had that those tech chops, he could go to the folks in the engineering group and, you know, he was super credible with them. So, you know, developing these bridging personalities who have credibility in both camps uh, is another uh, factor that I think is very important. Some great final thoughts there. We, we've we got a little bit of housekeeping to do as we, as we clean things up here. So we've got, we've got an upcoming program, Rob, that you're going to teach. We, we put it together. Do you want to just talk a little bit about uh, what's in that program? Yeah, I think in that program, we'll be going, uh, you know, deeper on a lot of the things that we've been talking about and, um, you know, taking, um, you know, uh, anatomy of innovation process, why innovation is hard. Uh, those will be topics that we'll tackle. And also this last question, which, you know, it's a big, big topic and we've touched on some things, but there's a lot more to say about innovation culture and uh, how we create an organization that is able to be what, you know, what uh, researchers call ambidextrous, that it's able to keep its innovativeness alive while it's very good at efficiency and hitting business targets. All right, fantastic. Rob, thanks so, thanks a ton for, for joining us. I, I know you put a lot of time into the prep and you, you made time today. I know, I know you're, uh, you're out of province and um, you're good, good enough to make some time for us, so thank you. Sean, can you remind everyone in the audience about My the pleasure. recording and where it's going? Sure. As I mentioned, you can find all of our past episodes on ivyacademy.com slash blog. Uh, we'll also be sending out an emailed link later today that you can share with your colleagues who might be interested. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, Rob, again, thank you. And to everyone who tuned in, uh, appreciate it. And we'll uh, see you next week, I hope. Cheers. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everybody.